Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Gloveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, kick goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to do it. In today's age, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and learn more especially if you've not yet turned off your push notifications like I've been telling you to. You might hear some of my author interviews and think, wow, I'd love to read that book, but with so many great books out there, you don't have the time to read them all. Well, there's one app I highly recommend, and it's called Blinkist. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways and need-to-know info from thousands of non-fiction books and condenses them down into just 15-minute reads. That's 900 seconds. Prefer to listen to books? Blinkist has you covered. As an advocate of short feedback loops, I like Blinkist because I can learn and apply key concepts to my business and life faster, which means I get results faster. I use Blinkist when I'm in the gym, pounding the pavement and commuting. I've listened to books like Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari and Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman on Blinkist, two books you should most definitely check out. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for Future Squared listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash Future Squared to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash Future Squared to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash Future Squared. And now for today's guest. Players that naturally, you know, play better for certain coaches um, because for whatever reason they have much more of a connection. I think that's probably the biggest thing. The biggest turnaround in coaching is that connection relationship piece. Mm. You know, you really have to have a relationship with 44 players and yeah. it becomes extremely difficult. So that's probably one of the first things you're trying to do is, is connect with all the players, you know, get good relationships. And I was really fortunate at Sydney because I'd already played at Sydney. Mm. So I already had good relationships with the players. But the other thing I did, which was extremely valuable because one of the things I think you know through your questions which reminds me is you, you, you can never forget what it's like to be a player and in a corporate sense don't ever forget what it was like to be that person coming in your organization just because you're a leader and one of the best things I did at the end of October 1998 was write down the 25 points of the things I liked about my coaches and didn't like about my coaches and that was incredibly valuable to put myself in the shoes of the players. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 360 with Paul Ruse. Ruse is a former Australian rules footballer and senior coach in the Australian Football League. Ruse represented the Fitzroy Lions and Sydney during the 1980s and 1990s, playing 356 games over 17 seasons. Ruse was the senior coach of the Sydney Swans and the Melbourne Football Club from 2002 to 2010 and 2013 to 2016, respectively. Ruse was inducted into the Australian Football Hall of Fame in 2005. He's won many accolades throughout his career. He was named All-Australian seven times, received the league's Most Valuable Player Award, and represented Victoria on 14 occasions in the state of origin. After finishing as a player, Ruse went on to become a successful coach at Sydney, guiding the Swans to the 2005 Premiership Trophy, their first in 72 seasons. Today, Ruse is a media commentator and also works with businesses and people to help them perform at the highest level. We unpacked numerous lessons on leadership that transcend both the athletic and business domains and impact the way we live our lives. Expect to take lots of golden nuggets out of this conversation, including how to lift the spirits of an underperforming team of people, why accountability 
and ongoing feedback is key. Why leadership isn't about having all of the answers. Why you can do everything right and still lose, or do everything wrong and still win. And to that point, why we should focus on the process instead of the decision. How to ensure people don't become complacent after a big win. The value of authenticity and vulnerability. Keeping yourself accountable as a leader. Creating space for serendipity. How to scale culture and so much more. This is a 90-minute long episode, but it could have just as easily been twice as long, as Ruzi, as he is affectionately known by the AFL public, brought almost half a century of competing at the highest level to the conversation. With that, strap yourself in for a conversation with the one and only Paul Ruse. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, we're here sitting not too far from Port Phillip Bay. Big question. Do you still get out into the water for some cold immersion in the mornings? Or? <laughs> I've got a jet ski on the pier, which I take out of in the summer. But uh, yeah, no, it's funny because we've got a place in Hawaii. Yep. And I, as a kid, I used to go down to Wilson Prom, which is the southernmost tip of Australia. Uh-huh. So, and the water down there was brutally cold. But I think since I've been to uh, Hawaii and got a house, I've been spoiled over there. So yeah, I, so not as game or I spend less yeah. and less time in the water here <laughs> than I do. I think it's a bit like when you ski in Australia and you go overseas and ski, you get a bit spoiled. So, yeah, and we got the pool at the back, so yeah, occasionally I jump in the hot spa. Yeah, I've been hitting the uh, the surf down at Ocean Grove, and uh, as it's gotten deeper into winter, the uh, the thickness of the wetsuits also yeah, yeah. gotten a lot thicker as well. Um, so I'm really keen for today's chat because it's an opportunity to talk about lessons from the athletic domain. Obviously, you had a decorated career as a footballer and, and a coach in the AFL, um, but understanding how those lessons apply more broadly in business and in life. Um, but I'd like to go back to uh, to Donvale, where uh, you played footy as a, as a young kid. Um, I'd love to just learn, like, what was it like coming up the ranks as a, say, 12, 13, 14-year-old? And Because um, we've all been there particularly a lot of the, the males listening to this. Um, they may have had their doubts, their insecurities, and um, just keen to understand what you remember from that time of your life. Yeah, it's a good question because probably not until you get older, you reflect too much on when you were younger. But mm. And having played and coached, uh, I think I reflect more on the lessons I learned as a 12, 13, 14-year-old and how important sport is in everyone's upbringing, regardless of whether you're, you're going and play with Fitzroy or you're you, you go in the workplace at 17, 18 or 19. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that hit me. I was really fortunate. We bought uh, in Donvale the family. Okay, time slips by, but in the mid sort of 70s. So back then it was a really uh, you know, a new um, estate, uh, yeah. a lot of orchards out that way, but also a lot of playing fields, creeks, uh, tennis courts, um, everything. So, you know, my whole life was sort of spent outside really. You know, mm. now that was – basketball, tennis and football, they were the three sports and that just immersed my whole week and then coming home from school, you wasn't much homework back then so you just drop your bag, you had your Vegemite and toast, maybe watched <laughs> a bit of Gilligan's Island or Brady Bunch. Gilligan's Island, yep. Yeah, and then, and then ran outside and pretty much spent the whole time ride, ride the mate's house, ride down the creek, kick mm-hmm. the footy outside. So I think just the activity levels were enormous back then. So the ability to get outside, and I know there's huge problems now with, um, you know, childhood obesity and yep. health, et cetera, et cetera. I think the lifestyle for us was just so much easier to remain active because mm. there was four channels on TV, there was no social media. But in terms of the team concept, Clearly, when you start out as a kid playing sport, you you have no idea you're going to play AFL. So you're really playing for enjoyment. You know, you're playing yeah. for fun. You're playing for mateship. You're playing to just to learn some some basic lessons, which you probably don't even understand at the time. Um, so when I reflect on my time, a lot of it was around the stuff that I. Yeah, you know, when I went to Fitzroy, just on teamwork, yeah, you know, playing a role within the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, understand the discipline of turning up to training on time and you know, wet night, miserable night at Beverly Hills Junior Footy Club, making sure you're there, making sure you yeah, you know, you don't hide behind the trees and and um, you know, not training sort of thing. So yeah, it was a really, really good time. Um, you know, tennis was big as well and basketball. I, I was hey, lucky you're a big to play. basketball fan as well. Yeah, huge basketball fan and, and back then basketball was nowhere near as big um, and I think I started because we had actually most kids played cricket and football mm. but I think uh, we had a basketball team for Donbile Primary School so I started that and I just loved it 
Um, so, yeah, the whole life was great, but definitely the lessons from even junior coaches, I think that's why I say all the time, like, it's a great responsibility. I think we undervalue teachers and we certainly undervalue mm-hmm. value junior sports coaches because mm. if you get a good one, um, you know, the lessons they learn, the discipline, um, all those sort of things I talked about before, just, I mean, really, that hold you in good stead for the rest of your yeah. life. And I think that's the difference nowadays. And you mentioned that nowadays we have a lot more obesity. And I think the um, instance of diabetes has increased by a factor of at least two in the last 20 or so years because people have such uh, sedentary lifestyles. Um, but not only that, now as a kid, it's so much easier to just go home and sit on your iPad and, and just sit on your butt all, all evening, um, which not only is bad for you physically, but when it comes to that mindset, that discipline, like you said, you know, it's a cold, rainy night in the middle of winter going out to Beverly Hills Footy Club and actually turning up and training as opposed to hiding behind the trees. Whereas nowadays, it's so easy for kids to, you know, proverbially hide behind the trees by way of just sitting on their iPads all the time and missing out on those key life lessons. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, it's so so different. And I think also homework. That was That's probably the biggest thing when my boys went through school. It, it was, gee, I, I probably didn't do any homework until maybe year nine or ten, and mm. it was all about learning in the corrupt classroom. So you, you actually – you were given time to do all these things. And I think that's one of the great challenges and great impediments to you know, when the boys started at Wallara Public School, which was a great school, and then went to Cranbrook. I just remember at such an early age that, oh, I've got to do a project tonight, Dad. I've got to do homework tonight. I've got to homework tonight. I've got homework tonight. And, you know, and it's the balance of the learnings, but the balance of, of moving the body and, um, you know, getting on the bike and riding over the mates and kicking the footy or whatever you might do. And, mm. Gee, I mean, the, that. That exercise far outweighs, in my opinion, you know, in that, at young age about doing the project or doing the, the maths, the sums or whatever, yeah. or doing the writing test or whatever because they're the lessons. If you don't learn them early enough, it's, it's easy to sit in front of the computer. It's easy to be sedentary. It's easy to not get involved in sport because there's enough things to do now. It's easy to say no. So mm-hmm. the ability to encourage kids um, at any level f- for the activity, I think, is really, really important. So there's a lot of differences in lifestyle. There's, there's no question. Yeah. Um, I mean, esports has become a huge, huge industry, I guess, in itself. Mm-hmm. It's, it's never. I mean, I laugh with the boys. I said we had pong, which is a little thing if people remember. A little yeah, stick yeah, that yeah. goes up and down. It was one of the goes. first video games. First video games. <laughs> Pac Man and the, and basically Space Invaders, Space, in, Space yeah. Invaders, Pac Man and Pong, and then you Frogger. Had the, was Pro- Frogger was Frogger was, was sort of a bit later, a bit later was, yeah, yeah, a bit later was, <laughs> yeah, and then the pinball machines, you know, so they could only yep. keep you engaged for a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But these things now, like what is it, Fortnite and Call of Duty, and all these things that were they're just so lifelike. So there's a lot, a lot of challenges that we mm. didn't have to face. Yeah, and I think we are. Uh, talking about that last week over coffee when we said one of the strengths or competitive advantages that you can have as a human being today is the ability to disconnect and not be completely immersed by your phone and checking it every five minutes. A hundred percent. Yeah, it was a good conversation we had, wasn't it? Because if you want to get ahead, there's so many kids or, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 that either want to travel overseas mm. and spend a year, two years, three years, um, you know, get immersed in the, the internet world or the esports world. That if you are, you know, a proactive and you are yep. ready to get out and get into the workforce and and get up the the sort of ladder, you're going to get a huge leg up on on so many people. Now, there's mm-hmm. not a right or wrong. It was just no. a discussion we were having. You know, if that's the way inclined. I mean, I know a lot of kids are traveling now, which I don't think is a bad thing. I mean, getting overseas and learning about mm. other countries and mm. providing providing you're not just sitting in a pub in Greece for two weeks and spend yeah. all your money, you might as well be down in a pub in Elwood or, or Port Melbourne. So gaining those life experiences. But certainly if you are someone that says, no, I've done my degree, I want to get out, I want to get a, a leg up, you know, by, by 25, 26, you're going to be in a really good position because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of young adults that don't want to do that yet. You know, they're, they're on a different path. So if you are on that path, um, you know, well done, good luck, and you are going to get a fair way ahead. 100%, 100%. So um, you mentioned earlier that, as a kid, it was just about fun. It wasn't about becoming an AFL footballer or a VFL footballer as it once was. Um, but at some point, that changed. At what point did that happen for you where you thought, okay, actually, I might make a career out of this? Yeah, I sort of remember – I can't remember what year it was, but I do remember a defining point. I, I sort of been went down to training and I sort of wasn't training that well at Fitzroy's in the under-19s and – 
you know, I sort of got a bit lazy with my footy and mm. I was always had reasonable talent. And I, and I just remember, you know, coming home and sort of thinking, you know, you've either got to want to do it or you don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you don't want to do it, whatever that is, and that's, again, it's not a right or wrong. If you don't want to do something, just you better not to do it. You know, and, and I just remember thinking, yeah, it is something I want to do and I want to put, put 100% into it. And that's probably one of the great lessons that, you know, it doesn't matter how much talent you have, if you're not really prepared to invest in your career, whatever that career is, mm. you know, you, you're going to you still be semi-successful. And I've seen, you know, a lot of players play footy and I'm sure you've seen a lot of people in corporates that have made yep. a, a fist of it, but never really got great fulfilment, never mm. really got to where they – so I think from that moment I, I sort of thought, no, nah, this is definitely something I want to do and – you know, then you you still have your your ups and downs, but you realise, yeah, you, know, you have to invest in your, you know, what you want to do, and you have to put time in and effort into it. And I was really, I was really lucky going to Fitzroy because I had great role models around me, so it wasn't hard to do it. Like mm. I wasn't swimming against the tide; I was yeah. swimming with the tide. So that does make it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, something Derek Sievers talks about uh, that it's either a hell yeah or a no. And if you're in that murky water in between, you you'll show up, but you won't. Give it 100%. And if you're doing something difficult, like trying to make it at the top level of the athletic domain or in the business world, you need to be showing up day after day after day. And if you tr- unless you truly buy into what you're doing, unless you're passionate about it, unless you're naturally inclined towards it, you're probably not going to do. A, you're probably not going to make it. Essentially. Yeah, I think it's a great way to put it, isn't it? Because you're right. A lot of a lot of people stay in that middle space. You know, somewhere between the hell yeah and the no. That's where they sort of sit and they mm. stay. And mm. I think there's a fear factor as well. Once you get to a position and you don't really enjoy it. There's the fear of what if I leave? What if I do this? So you just stand, stand to get comfort. Lucky. And I've seen players do that year after year, where you you just look at them and you know they're not giving 100, percent and you give them the benefit of the doubt. And then at the end of the next year, it's the same. So yeah, there is a point where you've got to. And then once you make the the commitment, as I said, particularly if you're swimming with the tide, if you're with a good company or with a good footy team, yep. it's easy because everyone is working hard. And and Fitzroy, you know, had some of the hardest working players I've ever seen. Mm. Their captain, Gary Wilson, was a standing role model. So when you see the captain, the best player, the most talented guy work the hardest, you know, it's a lot easier to do it. Bernie Quinlan was a Brownlow medalist. He, he worked really hard. You know, Laurie Serafini, Mickey Conlon, Ross Thornton, Leon Harris. I could name, you know, yeah. 20 players there. That yeah, And so it was more unusual to not to work hard than it was to work hard. So once you made the decision, you had so many people helping you along the way that it, you know, it became so much easier. Yeah, and I think that's potentially something that – that a lot of kids, younger people don't get the opportunity to to do, which is try different things on their way to figuring out what is that thing that just makes them feel like they're swimming with the tide. Um, because oftentimes we'll end up sitting in you know a career counselor's office, year 12, 17 years old. What do you want to do with your life? And you haven't really got any life experience to answer that question. And so oftentimes it's just going down some tried and true so-called safe path like becoming an accountant and 10 years later you wake up and you're like, man, I hate my life. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because we talk about the American system a bit, Tammy and I, um, you know, and the American college system is just so much better because you get that two years of general ed, you go in and mm. you're not really sure, whereas in Australia you, you tend to have to um, pick a course, you know, yeah. and there's that, there's that pressure around the the last year and you're going to get into accounting, you're going to get into a teaching, you're going to get into um, – you know, PE or whatever it might be. And you're right, how many kids know at 18 years of age exactly what they need to do? So yeah. I think the I think the whole school system at some point needs to be revamped, you know. It mm. needs to be revamped less around, you know, I mean, the actual pure education and the focus on year 12 and the pressure on kids to get certain marks to get into courses and, and more around those life skills and how do you get the life skills and then how do you extend that tenure you know, through to 24, 25. I think kids are probably doing it naturally now, mm. you know, by, by going overseas and by traveling. But it'd be nice for the system to work with them, not work against them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and as I said, you know, the American system where you tend to just apply to a college, you get into the college, um, you've got two years of general ed, and then you can pick your, you know, so 20. And, and it's, I, I guess the difference is too that the college system over there is about the whole experience as well. Mm. You know, it's not just about ac- yeah. academics, it's about, you know, sport and you know the, the basketball team, the football team. So you get a you get a life experience as well mm. as an academic. I think we try to do it here with the you know the the pub that 
that that group goes to and the, yeah. the club that people join, but it's probably not as organic as it is in, in America. Yeah, it looks like a lot more fun in America for an 18-year-old to go through that system. And I think a big part of it is also about independence because most kids end up, you know, leaving home yeah, moving and away, yeah. moving away for three or four years to potentially a different state, uh, a lot of unfamiliarity, and that yeah, forces yeah. them to become more resilient, essentially, and, yeah. and to build new bonds, which a lot of people struggle to do today. Again, going back to the... Uh, the technology piece, it's easy to sit behind your phone and not actually look someone in the eyes and have a genuine, you know, forge a genuine connection with someone. So Yeah, I think that, I think you're right. I mean the experience of the American college is 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 leaving home. Most Americans leave mm. home and they go at eighteen and they get in the dorm situation, they get with a group of friends and then you know, they immerse themselves in a the whole experience. So yeah. it, it's a dramatically different experience. And you're right, the connection is is that's one of our biggest challenges now it's to get off the phone and connect with people and yeah you know because human nature says we want to connect we want to feel valued but if we're never connecting and we're never talking we're never communicating then our self-worth continues to drop and you know we continue to it's a vicious cycle isn't it you go mm-hmm. back to your phone and back to your phone and back to your phone you get the, the dopamine hit when you're oh yeah like on it's your like the slot machine in our pockets yeah that's yep. right so that's the easy to get validation through that rather than normal human interaction yeah yeah couldn't agree more so um, I wanted to change tact a bit and I mean I can use what you said there as a segue around uh, the skills that kids are learning in schools you know we, we need a revamp and um, I think it was the World Economic Forum who published a report that found you know for the next 10 to 15 years what kids really need to be focusing on is resilience adaptability critical thinking collaboration and problem solving and essentially a lot of the skills that go into leadership yep and um, I mean, you had a decorated career as an AFL coach. Uh, you, I mean, let's, I've kind of jumped over the fact that you played 356 games for uh, Fitzroy and Sydney across 17 seasons, um, coming close to winning the Brownlow on a couple of occasions as well. So definitely have to mention that, but wanted to focus on uh, your coaching in this podcast. And um, it was around 2002 where you joined the Sydney Swans halfway through the season and they were having a, a, a absolutely terrible season. Um, you were brought in as a caretaker coach and for the last, I mean, you won six of the last 10 games. Now, I guess what I'm interested in there is the fact that you were able to turn around the spirits of the players. And I imagine when you joined the locker room, the, the spirits would have been pretty low, morale would have been low. What do you do to lift the, the spirits of a team who just aren't performing? Yeah, it was it was an interesting time because um, Rodney Ede, who was coaching under, you know, I was assistant coach, and and Rodney was, and I think there's just just yeah, you know, Rodney was a good coach, but probably just run his race, and he probably recognised that as well. So mm. yeah, you know, when you get the end of someone's coaching tenure, and the players sort of get a bit tired, and they you know they just sort of stop listening, the club starts to panic a bit because everyone wants to win a premiership and you seem further and further away sort of thing. So it was sort of a perfect storm. And, mm. and Rocket sort of you know, read the play a bit and realised we got beaten by Geelong at the SCG. I think they kicked the last four or five goals, looked like we were going to win, and then sort of pandemonium broke loose within the footy club and then you know, Rodney retired, uh, left on the Monday sort of thing. So I guess then you got to sort of figure out what you're going to do because mm. I didn't really know whether I was going to coach up until that point so it all happened extremely quickly and then um we had a meeting dennis carroll was our chairman of selectors and there was the three three coaches i think steve malaxos john longmire and myself and we just sat around with cole siri and you know what are we going to do what are we going to do and we discussed maybe coaching as a group and then i got asked to do it so yeah pretty quickly you got to sort of come up with a plan you yeah. know it, it, it happened we did have a buy on the following weekend and then we we played the so I think the first thing is just to reinforce to the players, um, you know, the val- their own self worth, and and try and get a bit more confidence in the group, because everyone was down at that stage, you know, me included, and Rocket was disappointed, and the club was disappointed, the players were disappointed. So the first stage of it is just to create some excitement and enthusiasm, yeah. and just make sure players want to come into work every day, yeah. uh, and and a bit of that just happens through the change anyway. Yeah, and again, this is nothing. Again, I've seen it happen, and I'm sure Rodney had say the same thing that that just just through having a different voice creates change yeah changes as good as a holiday yeah well, that's right and and also <clears throat> i think the other thing you've got to be careful of is is in the initial stages particularly in footy when you're playing every week you can't change much at all mm. so really it's just picking one or two things and saying these this is how we're going to play we're going to have a bit of fun for the rest of the season yep. and you're just sort of trying to get through that 10 week block 
I think the other thing that naturally happens is rather than the players thinking they're four and eight, you know, if we're four and eight, we've only won four games, they tend to think of it as zero, zero. So they, they tend to think about it. So there are some advantages taking mm. over, which I probably didn't realise at the time, but when I look back on it, you know, it was probably the easiest 10 weeks of my coaching career um, because of that instant sort of turnaround you can get. Mm. But then you've got to, then you've got to coach, you know, so yeah. then there's the actual technical side of it. But again, what you try and do is maybe change things up slightly, but you're meeting your cadence is really in place when mm. you're reviewing and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's probably not until the off season when you really start to be the coach. You know, then that's when you've got to think about trading and um, who you're going to bring into your footy club, who you're going to delist, how you're going to manage the medical staff and the fitness staff and the and the coaches and the players, etc., mm. etc. So really, that's that's when the, the coaching really begins at the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one thing that I wanted to touch on there was this whole notion of a, what psychologists call the fundamental attribution error, right? Where we, if we suck at something, we'll blame yeah. circumstance. Yeah. But if someone else isn't performing, we'll blame character defects in that person as opposed to circumstance. But I imagine when you took over, obviously there was that organic shot in the arm of change, uh, which is always a positive, but I imagine that there was players who struggled under Ronnie Eid who suddenly blossomed under under you but whether or not that had to do with your coaching or whether or not it was just a change i imagine that took place in some players that transformation yeah absolutely yeah and you're right i mean it doesn't matter whether it's me leaving sydney for, for john longmore replacing me or, mm. or me leaving melbourne and simon goodman there's going to be co there's going to be players that naturally you know play better for certain coaches um, because for whatever reason they have much more of a connection. I think that's probably the biggest thing. The biggest turnaround in coaching is that connection relationship piece. Mm. You know, you really have to have a relationship with 44 players and yep. it becomes extremely difficult. So that's probably one of the first things you're trying to do is, is connect with all the players, you know, get good relationships. And I was really fortunate at Sydney because I'd already played at Sydney. Mm. So I already had good relationships with the players. But the other thing I did, which was – extremely valuable because one of the things I think, you know, through your questions, which reminds me is you, you, you can never forget what it's like to be a player and in, in a corporate sense. Don't ever forget what, what it was like to be that person coming in your organisation just because you're a leader. Yep. And one of the best things I did at the end of October 1998 was write down the 25 points of the things I liked about my coaches and didn't like about my right. coaches. And that was incredibly valuable to put myself in in the shoes of the players mm -hmm. and never forget what it was like to be a player. Now, bearing in mind October 1998, I didn't ever know whether I was going to coach or not coach, but I never ever wanted to forget about that connection. So mm -hmm. that way I could think about, well, what was Mickey L. Lachlan going through? You know, what was Paul Bevan going through? You know, vastly different um, you know, people, et cetera, et cetera. So I really, I always encourage that of leaders um, in the corporate space as well. You know, yeah. take yourself back to when you start an organisation through your junior days prior to you becoming in a leadership role, what did you like about your leaders and what didn't you like about your mm. leaders? And I reckon if most people are honest, they'd be doing things now they said they hated. Yeah. Because habits are really hard to change and holding yourself accountable is probably the most important part of leadership. You know, mm. how do I hold myself accountable to the things that I think the players want me to be held accountable to? And so that, that document was in my desk for eight and a half years when I was coaching Sydney, and it was the first thing I took out when I started coaching Melbourne. Have, have you published that online at all? Yeah, it's in, the, yep. it's in my book here. It is. Yep. Um, so I think it's up there, Dylan. Sorry, we'll add a, a link to the show notes to, to the book as well for the, for our listeners. Um, but they're simple. They're really simple things. It's like players don't mean to make mistakes. Hmm. You know, so when I sit down as a player and I, and I look at that and I go, Players don't mean to make mistakes, and and the other ones which I reckon are really valuable. Here it is. Oh, here. Then we've got some notes. Yeah, I, I actually had it the other day. Um, coach's attitude will rub off on the players. Again, if you mm. think about this as a leader, yep. so your attitude. You walk in on a Monday or work on a Wednesday. You've had a bad meeting Tuesday afternoon. You've lost a big sale, and you come in. Everyone's watching. Everyone's waiting to see how you you react. Yep. You know, um, if if coach doesn't appear happy, relax. Players will adopt the same mentality. Well, we mimic people. That's all exactly. we do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this document was, you know, really never drag a player for making a mistake. You know, similarly, you know, I said this to some people the other day, have a look at the list and then flip it yeah. around to the corporates. Yeah. You know, no one goes in to have a bad day at work. No one goes in to not try in a footy team. Yeah. So then this this particular document was so 
valuable for me in those really – because under pressure, when, when things are going well, everyone's a great leader, you know, yeah, because – it's easy budget. to be a great leader when things are going well. Yeah, budgets are ticking <laughs> over. Everyone's selling stuff. Yeah, economy's great. Same in yep. footy. You know, Sydney. You know, Sydney. When we you know got on a bit of a roll, I think we were one and three in the first my first full year. We won the next game, and then we went on and won. Yeah, maybe ten of the next twelve. You know, yep. so during that period, I probably didn't have to refer to that too much. Mm. But it's under pressure. You know mm. what? That's what everyone's watching the leader under pressure. Yeah. You know, how do they react? You know, such a different reaction. When something bad happens, and I come up and say, "Steve, mate, look what you did yesterday. Let's just sit down. Let's talk about. It. I mm. reckon we could have done it better. You know, how do you think you went? Oh, you know, I think I stumbled through the presentation. Yeah, mate, just take your time next time. Yep. I reckon we've lost that deal. It's a vastly different conversation than, mate. You know, what are you doing? That was terrible. You know, don't ever do that again. Yep. So that, and that can be for you and the company." A defining moment. So that that's and that's you know particularly after a game. You know one of the things I wrote down is never fly off the high and laugh the game. If you've got nothing positive to say, don't say anything at all. Mm. In that moment, and you might know that as a leader, but in that very moment, that can break make or break your company. That's how big a moment that becomes because yeah. that conversation that you and I have gets relayed to just about every one of the employees that you go and talk to. And if you walk out of that office and and so everyone goes, what happened? My, oh, actually, Rizzi just wrapped his arm around me and said, how can we get better? How can I help you? Did I do a good job? Huge, it's yeah. It's a massively different conversation. Yep. People go, oh, really? Wow. Especially if you have that earlier on in your company's life cycle because yeah. then it just plants the seeds for the for the culture to, for years to come. Exactly. So then people are trying to find solutions rather than looking for problems. And then, mm. then, and then you become more invested in the company. You go, I really want to do better yeah. next time. And then you walk back to your desk and you work it out. And then the next time you – the other way, there's a bit of that F you mentality. Oh, well, you know, my car wasn't great, but F you, you know, mm. bloody um, – and then you start looking through the – whatever you do now, seek.com or yell at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Monster or whatever and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. looking for another yeah, job. You yeah. know, that's, that's how dramatic – that conversation can can be it's 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 huge. I, I shared this story on the podcast before, but one of our first big clients at Collective Campus was a large law firm, and it was almost a six figure deal. And we kind of rushed into it, just excited by the fact yeah. that it was a big deal, right? And we've got a big brand under under our books, but essentially there was a lot of holes and there was issues, and we got some negative feedback from the clients halfway through the um, delivery of this course. And uh, essentially, at that point, it was an opportunity. Like, what do I want this organization yeah. to be? About? About. So I sat the team down. We walked through every single customer touch point from the moment we first spoke to them to the last uh, workshop we ran and asked the question, what could have been better? What could we have done better? Put together a list of about 20 things, called a meeting with the client, sat them down, said, hey, here's everything we stuffed up and here's what we're going to do to make it better. And not only did the rest of the course go amazingly, we got a lot of great feedback. That feedback helped us to secure a bunch of other clients in their industry around the world. But the most important thing was the fact that it created this culture of extreme ownership rather than making excuses where people were essentially empowering themselves to do something whenever there was a problem rather than just become a victim, in, in which case you just go backwards. Yeah, and I, I think one of the biggest misnomers about leadership is leaders have to know everything. Right, yeah. The, the greatest thing you can do as a leader is say, oh, I messed up, you know, I, I could have done better. Suddenly that... That, that notion permeates through the whole organisation rather than this notion of the leader can never admit he's wrong or always has to be this strong mm. voice and et cetera, et cetera. So your ability to go back and, and immediately own own your mistakes because everyone makes mistakes. Oh, you know? yeah. And I think the other thing that's really, really uh, valuable for people listening is don't always define your success with – that hundred thousand dollar deal. Mm. It's what happens within that deal, and, and particularly in footy, it's so easy to do. You know, we, you could win five or six games in a row and be, be having some creating some really bad habits. Yep. If you don't address those really bad habits, then that'll become what they are yeah. habits. So you got to be careful as an organisation, certainly as a sporting team, if you want to become the best, most consistent business you can be. Don't just say, oh, yeah, we've had a great month because we've sold $10, $10 million. Yeah, you might have had a great month, but those behaviours that you've created through doing that mean that three months later that $10 million's dropped to $2 million because everyone out in the work workforce, that you, all your clients are going, mate, 
they were terrible. You know, yeah. we, we used them once and we're never going to use them again as opposed to a two million creep into five million because you've worked really hard. You've created yeah. then the two million people to me and go, you've got to go and get the Bruzy's company. They're, they're amazing. You yeah. Know? yeah, but they're only small. Yeah, but I tell you what. They deliver, they deliver on their word. They do everything they say they do. The 2 million becomes 5 million, becomes 10 million. Yep. And again, it's the same in footy. You know, you might start off a bit slow, but the habits you're forming, it's easy, and I say this a lot, it, it's sort of easy to stay in that, you know, 7th to 10th bracket or 12th bracket in AFL footy. Um, but to become the a premiership team, to become mm. a consistent top four team, yep. you've got to have really good habits. And that's... I suspect it's for you guys. It's the yeah. same in business. You know, it's sort of easy to be a mediocre business, but yep. to be a great business. So don't be outcome focused. Be really process orientated and, and make sure you get that right. I think that's absolutely huge. And um, we touched on this last week when we mentioned uh, Annie Duke. I know the, you've seen her play before the former World Series of Poker Champion and, and she calls that resulting yeah. where we conflate the quality of an outcome with the quality of a decision when the decision may have been flawed but you just got lucky. What's important is that process. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it was uh, that story of uh, Belichick versus yeah, Pete yeah. Carroll, um, yeah. the Seattle Seahawks versus the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl final about what, three or four years yeah. ago where um, Carroll elected to uh, pass for a touchdown with like four seconds left on the clock. And and more often than not, that would have been the right decision. But because the ball was intercepted, everyone said, terrible decision. He was crucified by the media. But if that pass was executed correctly, yeah. uh, then it would have been a totally different story. They, they, they would have said, Carol outsmarts Belichick and, and completely different. But people tend to conflate decisions with outcomes. And oftentimes, it's probably uh, to their detriment because then you just start making that same decision over and over and over again. And in the long term, like you said, you go from 8 million down to zero. Yeah. And the, and the industry that I'm in is probably the hardest because, uh, you know, and it ask, people ask me, what's the biggest difference? And, and the biggest difference is if your results were posted every single Sunday or every single Monday, how would your behaviour change? Because there's so much pressure on AFL football. So mm. it's so easy to stay in that outcome. Because if you win, the pressure's off you. It doesn't matter how you win. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, you know, well done for Melbourne or well done for Collingwood. They won. They won, they won, they won. So it's <laughs> so it's easy to stay in that that outcome focused environment. Yeah. You know, oh they lost, they lost, they lost. But the trick is probably more so when you're losing as a coach, making sure you know, yeah, but we're losing, but we're actually doing the things that we want yeah. to do really, really well. I'm not going to change that process because I reckon if we keep doing it, we get 22 guys to do it, they become habits, that's when we're going to be consistent winners. That, that That's that's an interesting point. I was, I was going to ask something to that effect. If I am, say, a player for a team or a corporate executive and I'm doing something week after week after week, I know it's the right process. It, it aligns with everything I've read, everything I've been told, but the results just aren't there. It's very tempting at that point to to try something else um, as opposed to stay the course. And and sometimes staying the course may be foolish because, hey, you've tried this and the metrics say it's not working. How does one differentiate between those two paths? Because you've got so many alternatives you can explore. Yeah, it's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's no question. I think – I think there's probably two sides to it. You know, you if you're really strong on it, you really understand it. I mean, every industry is going to have their technical component. What what, yeah. what do you technically need to do to be good at whatever? There's some technical components in football, clearly. But you've also got to do, which is the space that I work a lot in, behaviours. Okay, well, how do we act? Okay, mm -hmm. now if you marry them up together and you're really strong on your technical behavior, technical KPIs and your yeah. behaviours, how you act, you're generally going to get to where you want to get to. Mm. You know, Now, if those technical KPIs change slightly, the market – you know, drops or whatever, and your behaviours are still really, really good, rather than falling off the cliff, you know, you're going to dip a little bit because in a footy sense, your talent – I talk about talent-based teams and behavioural-based teams. Mm -hmm. yes. So a talent-based team, as soon as their talent leaves, they, they just go to the bottom of the ladder because yeah. they've got no talent. A behavioural-based team, if you look at teams like Sydney and Geelong and Hawthorne in particular, you know, when, when their talent drops slightly – their performance doesn't drop off a cliff because they're really clear on how they act, to your mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to work out you know, where has the industry shifted? You know, yep. Are we just going down this path? Do we need to slightly shift back? You know, The shoe that we're selling now It's probably a bit old. We need to maybe change the upper or change the sole or whatever yeah. it is sort yeah. of thing. So there's multiple answers to the question. But I think if you stay on the behavioural side and you get good people mm. working well, 
um, good leaders that have got good emotional intelligence, good yep. communicators, really honest. Then you're going to find that technical thing a bit quicker because you're going to have the conversations and people are going to be happy to walk in your office and go, Ruzi, look, I know, you know, we want to play like this, but I think the game's moved a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Your behaviours don't change. That's mm-hmm. the behaviour of honesty. Mm-hmm. That's the behaviour of, um, you know, um, listening and learning and delivering on your word or whatever yep. it is. But you might have to slightly tweak your technical side of what your business is. Mm-hmm. And it's always, it's a moving, it's, it's moving parts, isn't it? It you is. Know? It but is. if you stay, my, my advice is really work extremely hard on your behaviours. Ext- that's your culture. Work really hard on your culture. And then people are more likely, if you create a really safe environment, mm-hmm. an honest environment, people are more likely, as I said, to walk in your office and be able to make those technical changes that mm-hmm. allow you to continue to, to move forward. Yeah, yeah. And there is no one easy answer to this. And uh, I think it was Machiavelli who basically wrote that a leader should adapt his mode of operating to the times. And what may have worked, say, five or even 10 years ago or even one year ago, maybe it won't work now. Um, so it's about navigating that delicate balance yeah. between sticking with the process, but again, keeping your ear to the ground to make sure that the process uh, is adapted to the times as, as we move along. Um, but with um, talent v behavior, uh, I mean, from a business perspective, we see a lot of companies when the CEO leaves, company crashes. And uh, Jim Collins wrote about this in Built to Last. Um, we see this in a lot of sports teams. Sam Walker wrote the book, The Captain Class, where he just looked at hundreds of teams across the last hundred years, even Bob Rose's Collingwood Magpies. Yeah. And he found that oftentimes when a very influential um, captain left, the team just crumbled again. So it, it seems to be a case where a lot of these high-performing teams and companies are still very much built upon talents as opposed to behavior uh, but to the detriment of their ongoing success. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. I mean, what I learned from Fitzroy and probably the best way to answer the question is um, we had really good people. So the good people drive the good behaviors. Mm. But if you don't sort of document it, then when that good person leaves and two or three other good people leave. Yes. Um, so what, I guess, with the company and performance by design, it's sort of the reason we come up with the name is rather than just leave it to chance and mm-hmm. just, you know, not just, but but hope for good people in your organisation. Yep. How do you design your performance? Mm. How do you then say, well, we're not going to leave this to chance. We're going to harness what Bob Rose has done. What are the behaviours that Bob? What are the behaviours that he actually does? Yep. And that was pretty much the base of the system we put in place at, at, at um, South Melbourne with the Bloods culture. How do you not leave it to chance? How do you take those great leaders' behaviours? Mm. How do we document those behaviours? How do we then? And I think one of the biggest problems that, that's happening in, in footy as well is how do you develop the next group of leaders? Yeah, yeah, that's a really big challenge. So if you've got a a, a design performance model, mm. then it's not left to that chance. It's not left to well, gee, that Bob's gone or Paul's gone or Steve's gone. Gee, who's going to step up now? The conversation then goes, well, Bob's gone and, and Paul's gone, Steve's gone, but this is what we've documented. This mm-hmm. is how we act. Yep. And on that basis, gee, Dylan, his behaviours, his actions have been really, really good. We mm-hmm. now have to elevate him. But too often, leaders get elevated through their technical capabilities. Mm-hmm. We talk about competence and character. Yep. Most leaders go up the food chain based on competence, so their technical ability to do the job. The problem is once they get to that leadership position, They've got the technical capabilities, but yeah. they don't have the characteristics of a leader because yeah. we've never actually trained them to be a leader. Mm-hmm. And it, that's the biggest thing. If we work out what our behaviours are, and that's the biggest shift in footy now, is you know, if you look at AFL football, captains are no longer picked because they're the best technical players. Mm. And that really transformed with Stewie Maxfield. And, and I say this to people all the time. You know, like Stewie at the time, he became captain of the Sydney Swans. Uh, we probably wouldn't have been in the best 10 players in the team. Yep. And traditionally, the captain was the best player or the longest serving. And most of the time, they had really good values, you know, mm. most most of the time. But suddenly, you've got this transformation in football where leaders, so Stewie Maxfield, and then you had you know, Tommy Harley and, and Cameron Ling and um, Nick Maxwell yep. and guys like that, you know, so that they were picked as captain because their behaviours were really good. Mm. That's the shift 
to me in football that we yep. still haven't seen in the corporate space. It's, just, it's a lot about the technical yeah. capabilities. And then your senior exec team becomes very technically competent. Mm-hmm. But in terms of how they lead, it, and it's not their fault because they just haven't been given the skills, yep. it's very difficult. Yeah, very different um, character attributes. And um, I think in the corporate world, what we see is a lot of people who have the title of manager, yeah. but just aren't leaders. They don't no. have those characteristics. They haven't tried to develop those um, personal attributes. And oftentimes it comes at a detriment to their people who uh, on the back end or are on the receiving end of being micromanaged, essentially, uh, which is never a good place to be and it's never very motivating. Um, but also on... Um, on the technical characteristics, what we see is in a lot of tech companies in particular, you might be an awesome designer, an awesome web developer, uh, but as you spend more time in that company, you're expected to go up the ranks and uh, take on these leadership positions, even though the one thing that you're really great at, the one thing that you really enjoy is sitting behind yeah. you know, the interface and coding away. And so you're basically taking your best talent and just pushing that square peg into a round hole just because they've been there for X number of years. And I think in some companies now we're seeing that they're introducing two different tracks. You've got the individual contributor track where you just want to be there. You just want to be coding, developing, designing, being the artist. And then you have the manager track. And I think being cognizant of that and being cognizant that some people just want to be the technical person. They just want to be, you know, the uh, the guy who can kick a goal from 55 meters out. Um, but he doesn't want to be a leader. He just wants to be that one, um, full, you know, the one forward who is reliable. He's going to be there. He's going to mark the ball in, in most contests, and he's going to kick the goal from 50 or, or, or 60 meters in, potentially, right? As opposed to the guy who's going to have relationships with 43 other players, who's going to be that liaison between the players and the coach, um, who is going to rally the troops. Like they take two totally different types of people. One requires a lot more burden to be carried. Oh, 100%. And you're right. Every team has different people and different skill sets. You know, and too often I think you're right, not everyone wants to be a leader. Yeah. You know, people are happy playing a role in the team and playing mm. a significant role in the team. Yeah. You know, so just because they're technically competent doesn't mean they, they A, want to be a leader and, and certainly be uh, being capable. So it's identifying those people within your organisation that do have those leadership skills. And yep. I think you touched on at the end that leadership is, is exhausting. Oh, it, yeah. It's, 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 it's like... Being a coach is like having 44 kids. You know, every one of your people and players wants to know their value. You know, you have to have an open door policy, people walking in and walking out. You know, so if you're always bogged down as a leader on the technical side of what you're doing, Mm. and interesting what you said before about the two components, you're right. You've almost got the the CEO of culture and the CEO of the technical side. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to have one person doing both because if I'm immersed in the technical side of it, it's very hard for me to walk around the office and poke my head in and go, mate, Steve, well done on yesterday. That was fantastic. Did I help you enough with that presentation? And then go in and see Mary and say, Mary, look, can I sit down with you? I just want to chat through... um, yeah, where we're at with this. It, yep. it, and then by the end of the day, you know, you've, you've gone into 50 people's office and you've made sure they're all understanding of, of, of where you are and they're respectful of their relationship and yep. just checking in, asking them how they're going and do I need any help? No, you're doing a great job. So you go home pretty exhausted. But if you're always on the technical side, you're pretty much in your office the whole day and then people don't really know who their leader is. They mm. know who's got the title, mm. but they actually don't know who's leading the organisation. And, and I think that's a, a huge problem. And then, and then it's how do you give them the skill sets to be able to, to do it? And, and again, in, in AFL, it's very difficult now to a lot of discussion about picking coaches. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a great example because a, an assistant coach, and having done it myself, <clears throat> an assistant coach has maybe seven or eight players under their direct um, report and they go through vision, and then a, a line of the team, a defence. All of a sudden, they're jumping from that to 44 players, 10 coaches, eight medical staff, player welfare staff, marketing, sponsorship, media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that gap is enormous. It's just an enormous gap now for Brendan Bolton and mm-hmm. Stewie Jew mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. So the whole structure of the footy club organisation need to change and need to, so, you know, we've had Reese Shaw being reappointed. Reese, by his own admission, he needs some help. He needs someone. So I think you're going to see um, similar to what you're saying in the corporate, I think you're going to see slightly different roles where yeah. you're going to have this head coach slash manager and then you're going to have the technical game day coach and the game day coach will 
will, will be the guy, the reshore, and the other guy will be the one that manages it. And then through that process, Reese will you know, gradually get integrated yep. and understand and educated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the moment, it's very, very difficult, certainly in a, in a footy sense, to get the skills to become a, yeah. a, a very good senior coach. Yeah, and um, I think there's psychological grounding as to why it's exhausting. I mean, Dunbar's number suggests we can only really maintain 150 human relationships at a time. So if you've gone from just worrying about yourself to worrying about, you know, 44 players, coaching staff, media, sponsors, everything else, and you've gone from one to 100, and that's maxed out two thirds of the relationships you can keep in your head. We're not even talking about your personal relationships, family, friends, and so on, business associates. It's very exhausting. And, yes. um, and that's also why we see in a lot of companies as an organization gets bigger, like there might be a kick ass startup with five to 10 people, but as they get bigger and bigger, it's harder to maintain and scale that culture through the team because the leader who is building that culture finds it hard to maintain those relationships with everyone across the organization. So, I mean, in your case, when you were at Sydney, obviously you played with those guys. Um, so you had, I suppose, an unfair advantage in terms of building relationships with the players, but when you were at Melbourne, how did you go about building effective relationships with everyone? Yeah, that was the first thing we had to do because going to, to from Sydney to Melbourne, not having any relationship with any of the players, you know, and I took some of the coaches from Sydney and the message was, guys, I don't want to see you in your office. We need to build relationships really quickly mm. with the players. So whatever that connection point was, whether that was walking down the gym and just, you know, watching the workout or jumping in with a player or, you know, <clears throat> going to the next door and having a coffee, yep. um, it had to happen because, you know, the players want to feel valued as the staff at work do. You yep. have to have a connection. And even if to be a great manager, you know, you need to know what you, how you, you know, your staff is going. You know, what was last night like? Oh, I've just, yeah. you know, we just had a baby. I'm not sleeping. So to be a good, you know, leader of people, you need to know how people are affected by things that are outside work. So that was a huge focus for us in the first four or five months mm -hmm. before the season started. Yeah. You know, and then really build strong relationships. And, and then clearly it happened over time, but certainly the first four or five months, it was a huge emphasis to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's something, um, Bill Campbell, who was a famous coach of Silicon Valley CEOs, uh, he used to mandate that his teams, whether it was at Google or Amazon or Apple, would start meetings with trip reports where they would share what they did say on the weekend. They would just spend a minute talking about, oh yeah, I took my, my daughter to soccer training on, on Saturday morning. She scored a goal and I think that helped them to develop more than just the business relationship, but the personal relationship so that they would then interact with each other as human beings rather than just res human resources. Um, so it sounds like that's something that you practiced. Um, in the coaching domain, just really understanding what's going on in people's lives. Yeah, some great exercises. And we do something similar at Performance by Design, and we mm -hmm. do it in our meetings as well, and we encourage corporates. So what's, what's your biggest win for the week? Give a, mm -hmm. te give a teammate a shout-out. Yep. And the biggest win might be, you know, uh, on the weekend, my son's 21st, you know, we have yeah. people over. So you're starting to, to interact not just about the business sense, um, you know, you, you're talking about what you've done outside. Um, in footy, we used to do it a bit where you, you know, you, you tell a footy story and then a non football story and you have to bring in some objects and talk about your life. And some mm -hmm. of those were really, you know, heartbreaking, you know, some of the things. Yeah. But what it, what it sort of allowed you to do is connect at a much deeper level and then got a greater, much greater appreciation of the your players and the coaches did it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done it a few times with, um, with the corporates also. Yep. And, and the impact that that has <clears throat> on everyone in the room is quite profound. And suddenly you have this sort of breakthrough moments where people are not just interacting at that sort of work level, you know, how, how are you going? Well done. Yeah. Oh, great work on the proposal. It's, yeah, and again, some of the stories I've heard are, you know, quite um, emotional, very emotional, you mm. know, but it just it just brings a real human element to a workplace environment that we can often just walk past and overlook. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also if somebody's seemingly underperforming, at least you know why, because yeah. there's a lot yeah. of variables that impact how someone's feeling, whether it's their biology, whether it's what's going on at home, like there could be so many things. And understanding that is also going to make you more understanding and, and less prone to just judging their character, as we were saying before, like there's other things going on that influence someone's behavior. So, And I think it's not just about leadership, it's interesting. 
I mean, you're probably the same. I've been to a lot of conferences and I went to one last year. It's called Nurture Her and I just went mm-hmm. as a speaker. Um, and I think the impact that that had, you know, I was, I was lucky I was there for the whole time sort of thing. So I think, I think too often, whether it's a conference, whether it's a speaker, whether it's a conversation at work, mm. don't limit it to just being a good leader. I mean, we, everything's – I don't like the term work-life balance. It's just yeah. life. It's just life. Just life. Balance. Yeah. It's life. Yeah. You know, and, I, and it really hit me last year at the event that how, you know, taking themselves out of the business, being in, in Fiji in this environment that was much more vulnerable and safe, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. and the conversation that people were having and the life-changing moments there. So it's really just recognising those opportunities mm-hmm. and it might – it, well, it might, it's going to have an effect on all parts of your life, but don't necessarily look at it from the point of view of, well, I'm a manager at work, I need to do this conference because I'm a manager, or or because it's going to impact your whole life, mm. you know, your relationships inside your work, outside your work. Yep. And as I said, it's not work-life balance. It's just your life. Yeah. How do I get my life in order? And I, I think not enough <clears throat> people out there are stopping and giving themselves enough opportunity to say, yeah, I need to. I need to just take a deep breath. I need to get away from work. I need to do this, whatever it might look like. And, and there's too many excuses. Oh, yeah, but if I do that, people are going to say oh, I've spent X amount of money. If you come back to work and you're a better leader, a better person, if you come back home and you're a better husband, better wife, better father, yeah, people, no one's going to say, "Gee, why did you spend that money?" People are going to say, "Why didn't you bloody spend that money two years ago?" Yeah, you know. So it's all about that journey, that personal development and continuing to evolve and continuing to get better. Mm-hmm. And the and the and the better the leaders are as well rounded people, the better your organization's gonna be. Yeah. So you've got to really start to think about my message is really start to think about what that looks like for you mm-hmm. and don't apologize for it. Yeah. You know, if you want to improve yourself as a human being pick the right vehicle to, to do it and improve yourself as a human being. Mm. And I think it's also easier to strive for that work-life integration as opposed to balance when you have taken the time to figure out what work actually aligns with your natural inclinations. As we were saying at the start of the show, what aligns with your strengths, what do you enjoy doing, what fills you with joy, because then it is easier to just blur the lines um, as opposed to see work as something that you just hate and every Friday morning it's thank God it's Friday and, and, and whatnot. Then you can understand why people might want to just separate those two and just put work into some dark corner, dark recess of their mind and just not think about it come Friday night. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. It, it gets back to that passion and, that, and wanting to do it. And I think, um, you know, the ability to learn from other people, because mm. I think the other thing that happens with leaders is is once they get to a position, not not so much they shut themselves off, but people will almost shut them off and, and stop mm-hmm. giving them feedback. And, and, and it, they're probably the ones that need the most support and the yeah. most help to actually improve themselves because, you know, and having been a senior coach myself, some of the best conversations I've had with mates that I, I coach with and the feedback that they gave me mm-hmm. or getting to a conference or getting – so it's actually the – don't stop. My point is don't stop when you're there. Don't apologise, mm-hmm. you know, to do it because reality is unless you're learning from other people, it's very – you don't know what you don't know. So mm-hmm. we've talked about – Getting up to this level from a technical point of view, but how do we? How do I become a better leader? You yeah. know, how do I go and listen to someone who's been there and done that? How do I go and have a conversation with them around the pool where I can sort of say in a really informal environment, "Oh, that was great. I heard what you said. I heard you speak. So this is what I do. Mm. You know, how mm. would you implement? It? How would you implement in, in that forum? Yep. So keep developing, keep pushing yourself and don't think that you have to know everything. And I think that's a, a real epidemic where we're saying to leaders, yeah, you need to know everything. It's, it's the leaders that need to continue to evolve and continue continue to learn yeah i think it's the leaders that are authentic and vulnerable and tell yeah. you that hey here's the work i've done i'm about 75 percent sure this is the right path but here's what i'm not sure about and if these things come to be we'll go down this path that's a lot more authentic and vulnerable than someone saying hey here's what we need to do just trust me yeah uh and, and i think the latter uh type of attitude is what we see with a lot of leaders. They think we just need to have all the answers, but it's just not true. And and the, the former guy who says, hey, here's the work I've done. I'm sure about this, but I'm not sure about this. What do you guys think? And actually getting that buy-in from the rest of the team to come to a decision together. Yeah, that vulnerability piece we know is, is huge now. I mean, it's certainly, again, <clears throat> 
in footy had sort of transformed in the last five or six years. But, yeah, the ability to say, I don't know. You mm-hmm. know, can you help me? Um, Come up with a better I'll solution. Be lost. Have you got a better solution? <laughs> yeah. You know, but again, we just got to get away from the notion of the fear of saying, gee, I'm now in a leadership position. If I go out and say, I don't know, will people think I shouldn't be the leader? Absolutely not. People no. will think you're a great leader yeah. if you're prepared to say, I don't know, guys, can we have a quick meeting? This is what I think, but geez, you, you've got the technical expertise in that. Mm. Am I on the right path? Mm. Collectively, what do we think? Bang, you make it, make a decision. So it's absolutely valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, also, I think something we touched on last week was this concept of uh, what Jeff Bezos calls type one v type two decisions, and also leveraging other people's minds as a leader when it is a big consequential decision. Because you'd be dumb to just try and make that decision yourself when you've got an army of people you can draw on with their own experiences and their own worldviews. Um, but then there's a lot of decisions where perhaps they're not so consequential and we should just make that decision. And what we see in the corporate world in particular is that a lot of decisions are treated like those big type one decisions. And so we have a lot of meetings and 10 people sitting around a table and meeting to prepare for a meeting and a meeting to recap what was discussed at the previous meeting and ultimately nothing gets done. But the organizations that we see nowadays who are thriving are those that just empower their people, trust their people, have the right people on the bus, and they just make decisions. And if they screw it up, like we said, they take ownership, they fix it, and they move forward. And over a year, two, three, they end up way ahead of those companies who are still you know, sitting around a table having a meeting. Yeah, that's probably the single most frustrating thing, I think, coming out of footy to working more in the corporate space yep. is the inac- inaction. Mm. Um, having been in football, you know, you have to play every Saturday. So you can't ring up the AFL and say, look, we're not ready to go at 2.10. Can we move the game to Sunday at 4.40? Let's have a meeting about it. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it, it's just the, the ability to make decisions in football, yeah. to, to put s- systems in place, to train, to pick your team, to make a decision, to work out who's who's injured, who's not injured. So the whole week is just a, basically a series of decisions, whether yeah. it's collective decisions, individual decisions, yeah. um, and that's basically the, the, the space that I've existed in for the best part of 30 years. To go into the corporate world and to see how slow that it works mm. sometimes mm. is quite, um, a, it's quite staggering. Yeah. Because to your point, I think I think we all understand if it's a big decision that it, it's going to take some time. But my thing is, is gee, the, the lack of empowerment and the lack of ability for people to make decisions down yeah. the chain is just e- extraordinary. How slow that it can take, mm. and then I think I think it compounds itself because people think, <clears throat> well, I've got to take a little bit of time, and then they get to that time where they think they're going to make the decision. And they don't even make the decision then. They yep. then sort of think, well, I'm a bit because and it's just the habits permeate in their brain. So then they actually never make a decision. Mm-hmm. And I think that's again, that's the thing. And, and the beauty of what you're talking about is every skill is a learned skill. So I'm probably going to mess up my first two or three decisions. Yep. But unless I make them, I'm never going to learn whether I've done it right or wrong. So mm-hmm. then I continue to not make them. So by simply making a decision, you become a better decision maker. Yep. And then fifth or sixth decision in, just clicks. And then yeah. out of your 10 decisions, your nine are correct, maybe one. But unless you make a decision, it's very difficult to, to improve it. And again, it's just like a skill. It's like an honest conversation. It's like feedback. It's like um, yeah, promoting the first person, sacking the first person. Mm-hmm. Everything you do is I learn skill. So yeah. if you never do it, you're never going to learn how to get better at it. Oh, man, there's there's a, there's a lot in that to unpack. And I think one of the big things is also what you said, compounding. Uh, if you've got that type of culture where nobody's taking ownership, you might attract certain people to your organization, but you're not going to hold on to top talent. They're going to leave. They, yeah. they want to take ownership. They want to be in an environment where things are getting done. And so what happens over a long period of time is you just end up with an environment full of people who just want to make excuses and not take ownership. And obviously, that's a very bad place to be for any organization. But the other thing you also touched on was um, learning from failure. And uh, Scott Belsky, who founded this company called Behance, he sold it to Adobe for $150 million, said this great quote on my podcast a few weeks ago that we tend to misattribute um, our reasons for success based on what we'd rather remember versus what we'd rather forget. So question for you, Paul, what would you rather forget that you credit to your success? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 
I think I'd probably answer a different way. I think yep. a mate of mine, Rossi Lyon, who who um, coached Freo, and I've said this to him all the time, like the only – I won a premiership in 2005, played in the grand final, played in a premiership, um, coached back-to-back in 2006. Mm-hmm. And what I've said to say, try to say to Ross, because he gets unfairly criticised, is – the only difference that's between Ross and I is Leo Barry took that mark in 2005 mm. and the ball bounced sideways for Stephen Milne in 2009 or 2010. Yeah. And I think that's to, to the point we've been talking about. It's the ability to understand what the success is and mm. it's the ability to understand why you failed. And I, and I think the other thing is we're not great at, at – at accepting failure, we and the word itself lends itself. It's, it's such a negative word. Yeah, it almost needs to be back to school. That's what we've learned you know, in school that it's bad. That's right. Yeah. So, you, so that's part of the problem. I think is is everyone's going to have some sort of. <clears throat> I mean, failure is really learning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what have you learned along the way? Mm-hmm. But we see such a negative connotation to it. So I think for me, I think when I look back. Hopefully, one of the strengths I had is the ability to understand what success looked like. Mm. And I remember often speaking to the board at, at Sydney Swans in particular, and we talked about success. And I said, guys, if if we're always going to define success or failure as winning and losing, mm. then there's only one team that's successful every year, and that's winning the premiership. Yep. So we have to redefine this notion of success. And, and I talk about a lot what your brand is, you know, what it, and I think what, again, using footy analogy, what Sydney have done with their brand mm. is really strong. Mm. You know, if I said to people now how many games Sydney have won, most people would probably say oh, eight, nine, ten. They've won six. But their brand is so strong and there's a real connection to being part of the Sydney Swans footy club. Yep. Hawthorne's the same. So you've got to you've got to redefine what success looks like. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've been able to – hopefully establish over the years is, and I talk about process all the time, just stick to the process, yep. you know, control what you can control. Yep. Again, it's back to what you're talking about before. Often in a, a sale or a, uh, you know, I mean, Ross couldn't control where that ball bounced. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't control the market. You know, if I'm a real estate salesman, I can't control, you know, whether the market's good or bad. Yep. What I can control is how my staff act you know, during that sales process. Mm-hmm. What I can control as a coach is how we how we review that that bounce. Guys, we've done everything right. Um, and it's hard to do, but I remember saying a couple of times after we've lost the game, guys, we will we would typically win nine out of these ten games. Yeah. So and that's really hard to do. And that and I guess that's the the total balance of being a, a leader and running a company is what is success and what is failure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, that's so true, especially of uh, early stage companies who, uh, especially for first time entrepreneurs, you know, they may have jumped out of the corporate world, maybe they're on a pretty packet and suddenly they find themselves earning $500 a week, but that's their one metric of success. Like they're still focused just on earning. But during the early stages, particularly during the first year to three years, it should be about learning over earning and looking at all these other dimensions that constitute success, like your own character development. What are you learning? Uh, are you actually doing something that aligns with your strengths, with your passions? And are you enjoying it every day? Does it make you a better person when you're at home with your family because you're actually enjoying your, your day to day as opposed to coming home miserable every night? So there's a lot of other things that people should be looking at rather than just the earning piece when it comes to, to business and any big, hairy, audacious goal. Oh, I agree. And, and it's also trying to put an old head on young shoulders. I think mm. that's the biggest thing, whether it's a young coach or yeah. a young guy that's come out of corporate starting their own business. And I get back to it all the time. Don't be afraid to learn. Mm-hmm. You know, don't be afraid <clears throat> to tap into other people. Don't think because you've started your, your company, you know, I've got to put 14, 15 hours in a day. Make sure it's productive. What mm-hmm. are the things I'm not good at? What are the things I, I am good at? Um and I think that's the biggest, one of the, the biggest missing pieces of the puzzle. You know, when you and I first met, we met at a conference. I keep going back to, to that. Um, you know, whether it's the, the, the Nurture of Her that I went to last year, Nurture 360, mm-hmm. you have to take yourself out of that environment because if it's like when, when someone says to you, you know, you say to me, geez, you, your kids have grown. If, you, if you're looking at your kids every single day, yep. you don't notice they've grown. So if you're in your business the whole time mm-hmm. 
and you're surrounding yourself, which you are, everyone that's in the business, mm-hmm. it's very hard to – so as a, as a startup guy or a young entrepreneur – Clearly, what you're going to do is just immerse yourself in the business, yep. and then you got your blinkers on, and, and you and you're going away, mm-hmm. and, you, you, and you think you're doing the right thing. And I suspect that what typically happens, you cut yourself off a bit from your your, your friends mm-hmm. and ex colleagues, and you just got bummed down, and you know head, head, head down, bum up, sort of thing, and you're just beavering away. My advice is pull yourself out regularly, pull mm-hmm. yourself out of your business. Work out what you, you can't do. Get with some like-minded people. Get over there. You know, have conversations. You never know where that next inspiration or that learning is going to be because it is. It, it's, it is hard to put, um, you know, an old head on young shoulders. So yeah. if you just simply, you know, beavering, 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 working, 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 you're going to miss a lot of those really, really good experiences. Yes. They're going to fast-track your company yeah. and that – you know, you touched on a really good point that you made. What part of the 14 hours is productive, really? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. What, where's the tipping point where you're better to go eight hours and then what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to get home, I'm going to invite Steve over for dinner, I know what he's done, I'm going to sit around. That's productive time. Mm-hmm. That's the life balance we're talking about. That's not the work-life balance. That's not saying, well, work, I've just left and I've come home to my life. No, mm-hmm. no, Steve – Sitting around, we're having dinner, we're having pasta, whatever. Steve says to me, mate, how's business going? Oh, look, I can, mate, I'll tell you this is what I did. Yeah. That's more productive than the, the six hours you're going to sit there at the end of an eight hour day and, you know, not really get much out of it. Yeah. And I think it's important that people create that space for serendipity. Um, and that's hence one of the reasons I went over to the space conference was to, to meet like minded people who are doing different things and to potentially foster new connections. And for me, I didn't go into it thinking I'm going to create business out of this. It was really an opportunity to just learn more about myself as well. Um, and to be vulnerable with people. And out of that, I made a number of awesome connections. And obviously, we're sitting down having this podcast and talking about how we might collaborate as well. Um, but also that piece about not working a 14-hour day, I think there's a lot of insecurity that goes into that as well, where it's much easier to sit behind your desk, look at the um, at your computer all day and tell yourself that you're doing what society says you're supposed to do at the expense of actually going out there and developing yourself, developing new relationships, which can be a lot harder than just sitting behind your desk in the comfort of your office. I, I want to read this because it's, yep. it's really to the point. I don't know how I stumbled across it. It was a lady called Bonnie Ware. Uh-huh. And it's the regrets of dying. So she actually – and it was really quite profound. And it, it speaks to what you're saying before. And she worked in palliative care for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the people were not getting out. And she just started asking the elderly people at the end of their lives what their greatest regrets were. And to your point, um, uh, the, the the top five. I wish I I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Yeah, that was number one. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. You know, and, and to your point, um, I wish I hadn't worked so hard, you know. Um, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Yep. That's right. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had let myself be happier. Yeah, so that's something I've you know, written down, I, I keep, because, you know, again, it's hard to put an old head on young shoulders, but that's a reminder for us that when we're sitting in front of the computer for eight or nine hours, when we're about to write our eulogy or someone's about to write our eulogy, mm-hmm. yeah, have, have we lived a life of purpose? Have, have we what we've done mattered to other people? You mm-hmm. know, the notion of this connection and giving, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're in it, it's very hard not to think, well, this is society wants me to do. So yeah. it was actually, you know, the, the number one was just, you know, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of yep. me, which yep. is huge. That, that's massive. And uh, I think nowadays, especially amongst the younger cohorts, it's easy to um, do what um, the founder of Angel East, Naval Ravikant, calls play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And when, like you said, when you're in it, it's easy to get blinded. So if you're on social media all the time, there's so much competition. Everybody's yeah. vying to get more followers, more likes. But that competition is blinding to to the truth or to your own personal truth. Like 
Is it actually going to create value for you by way of monetary gain? Is it making you a better person or are you constantly just buried in your screen and neglecting all of your personal relationships and not really developing your, your character attributes? Um, so when you're in it, like stepping outside of that and maybe spending a week away from social media in this case might change your perspective on it all. And you might come back to it and say, actually, I was much happier going out for a hike every day and, and catching up with my friends for lunch than I was, you know, constantly posting things. Yeah, I agree. And I think we keep getting back to the same thing. Thing. And, and again, getting back to the conversation I had before, it's not until you do it that you realise, but someone's got to someone's got to encourage you to do it. Someone's mm. got to encourage. Well, firstly, take responsibility of yourself. How yeah. am I going to? And what does it look like for me? How am I going to get out of this environment for a day, two mm. days, three days, whatever it is? Because if you stay in that environment, it's very hard to sort of see the forest for the trees. Yep. So, what does it look like for me? And and I keep getting back to the experience I had last year, and I hadn't. Yeah, even for me as a coach and as a player, I hadn't spent – I'd never been to a conference for four or five days. I'd never known what it really looked like. So, you know, when I went there to Fiji and and I – I didn't really go with any preconceived ideas. I just sort of went by saying, well, I got asked to speak here, which I'd done multiple times before, Mm -hmm. Um, hadn't been able to to spend time at a a conference. And and it was a real eye-opener for me. And I guess I, I sort of thought at 50, you know, when I was 55 when I went, this is quite staggering that this is my first experience to take myself out of an environment, spend a whole, you know, four days with with, with small, medium business entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and I had the best time mm. just being able to do that. And a bit like you said, what you said before, you know, I, I didn't really go with any preconceived ideas or whatever. What I did come back with was just reinforcing a lot of the views, con- connecting with a lot of great speakers, mm-hmm. great leadership messages, great mm-hmm. business messages, great connections, the ability to, to sort of say, well, this is what really important to me. And that was the common theme amongst all the, all the ladies, you know, that, um, at that the common theme was, wow, this is great to be able to – it's a personal development side of it, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. But more importantly, this is the first time I've actually pulled myself out yeah. and what is important to me. What do I need to do over the next 12 months? What are the changes I need to make? Or I think I'm on the right path. You know, I actually think I'm doing really, really well because yeah. of – but unless you actually do that, unless you pull yourself out of it, whether – and one of the things that I did which I think was really valuable, and obviously a lot of it's got to do with, you know, with, with Tammy being American, but at the end of every year as a family, we'd go overseas. So in a football environment, to get overseas was – a no one cares about Australian rules football in Africa or Aspen or mm. you know, America or whatever it is. So that was really, really helpful to put that into perspective, to sort of be able to get overseas, spend a month away, completely detract, pull yourself out of the yep. environment, yep. put everything into perspective and then get back really refreshed and, and ready to go. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in how do I do it, how do I pull myself out of that environment and whatever that environment is, you're going to have you know, some great learnings by doing it. Yeah, and imagine that's quite humbling as well because here, you know, obviously you're in the media all the time, whether it's you, whether it's the sport, but then you go over to the States and – it's just barren land as far as that's concerned. So it kind of, like you said, puts things into perspective. Yeah, hundred percent. And and then you can sort of start to be be true to yourself a bit more because mm. you know when you when you're here, in some forms you have to put a mask on, People whether it's the media you. mask yeah. or you know, the coach mask mm. or whatever it is. So it's great to be able to, and it's the same, you know, for for anyone. I mean, if you're the CEO of a, a massive big company and suddenly you're, you're walking around in a in a conference in Fiji and and no one really knows who you are. Yeah. You're, you're really disarmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your whole persona has been disarmed. So then you get stripped back to who you are yeah. as a person. Mm-hmm. Oh, I ran into Steve. Um, I didn't know that. He's the CEO of such and such and um, a massive company and this and that. But bloody hell, he's a nice person. You mm-hmm. know, we had a great con. So how do you disarm yourself? So you're right. So for me going overseas and, you know, just being who I am and being able to, you know, think and learn and listen and look around and 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 yeah, be in a, a private environment was really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Mate, we're almost out of time, but there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on before we wrap up, and then perhaps we can talk a little bit about uh, Ruse Men's Club as well. Um, but not really a, a, a fluid segue, but complacency. You know, in 2005, Sydney Swans, you guys won the premiership. Uh, I mean, you took over in 2003 as a permanent coach, and by 2004, you are in the finals. 2005, you won it. So, fantastic. Uh, 
you know, triumph over adversity and, and very sort of hockey stick growth uh, to use an entrepreneur term there. But when we get to that pinnacle, it's easy for us to become complacent. And um, I was lucky enough to see George St. Pierre, the UFC champion, uh, perform at, or speak at the Melbourne Convention Center last year. And he was talking about his fight with um, Matt Serra. Yeah. And he went into that fight just ill-prepared. Um, and it wasn't until uh, some of the event staff knocked on his door and said, GSP, are you ready? That he realized, crap, I'm not ready. <laughs> and and uh, he went on to lose that fight. And since then, he's always um, treated every single opponent in the same way. And he's never underestimated anyone. And I don't think he lost a fight since. Um, but coming back from that 2005 season, how do you maintain people's um, morale, confident, not necessarily confidence, but how do you make sure people don't become too overconfident to the point where it affects their work ethic? Yeah, we, we thought a lot about it. It's a yep. really interesting point. We did at the end of the season, we thought a lot about it because it's such a high, you know, and it was 72 years, obviously, you know, since we'd won it. Clearly, mm. the players weren't there for 72 years. But, um, <laughs> We're pretty good if they're yeah, uh, yeah. 90 years old. But the, <laughs> That notion was so ingrained. I think it just permeated on the players, even though you know some of the players might have only been in the club for one year, two years, three years. Yep. There was that mindset that it was 72 years for everyone. Mm. So we did. We thought a lot about it, and, I, and it's a really good point. I, and I got asked this question the other night about motivation. Is a coach's job to motivate the players? Yep. If you have to motivate the players, you've got a wrong, the wrong group of players. But as a leader, you have to make things different. You have mm. to... Make sure when you talk about complacency. So we we really consciously thought through it, and we we came up with an idea of saying, well, how do we just change things up slightly and almost like jolt the players into thinking this is this is a new year. Yep. We're not just coming back and starting training and and doing the same thing over and over and over again. We still want to stick to the process of how we played and mm -hmm. our technical skills. But one of the, the things we came to the conclusion, we had an opportunity to go to the 2006 Get ALA Week in, in Los Angeles, yep. and we jumped at it. You know, Because of that reason, I, I really wanted to jolt the players into thinking this is a completely different season. And we we invited the players and they, we said, you can bring your wives, you can girl, your girlfriends, and we're going to play. It was early and we weren't really ready to play. Um, I think it was late January where we had to put a team on the field. So North Melbourne playing um, Sydney – in, in Los Angeles at UCLA in the, mm -hmm. um, a big all purpose, um, venue there, a big soccer field they put together. Um, but it was as a result of what you're talking about. It was mm. how as a leader do I keep it the same, but different? So we're going to play pretty much the same. We're going to act the same. We're yeah. going to have the same key indicators. We're going to hold our players accountable to behaviors. But how do I? knock them out of this complacency and notion, oh, geez, we've just won this huge, something so big, we've got to do it again. You know, because I always had this theory, which is never going to get up, I always had this theory, if you win a premiership, you should have the year off, you should have 12 months yep. off just to yep. enjoy it because it's <laughs> such a big high. And, and, and Yeah, like four weeks off before you need to start pre-season? Yeah, well, most players sort of 10 weeks off, but yeah. coming back. So oh, I think that was really important for us. So yep. getting to L.A., Changing the environment, we, we went to LA, we came back via University of Hawaii, we trained the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, some players were a bit put out by it. Oh, we don't want to go, we don't want to go. You know, I can't bring my wife, I can't bring my kids, et cetera, et cetera. So it caused a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of angst. But by the same token, I think what it said to the players is, yeah, we, this is different. This is mm -hmm. not 2005. We yep. won a premiership. We're not going to sit on our laurels. We're not just going to come back and think it's going to happen again. Yep. And that's the balance. The balance of being a leader is you know, getting the right people that are already motivated. We had a great motivated group of people. I didn't have to motivate the, the players for mm. 2006, but what I did have to do in some shape or form is saying 2005 is over. Yep. Yeah, that's done. Well done. 2006 is going to be different. And we, we did put something – quite dramatically different yeah. and then we were able to play in the grand final again in 2006 yeah. and I think that had a big bearing on our ability to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, building up upon that, a uh, conversation we had at Space was around ego and when you've got you know 44 players at the top of their domain, uh, all quite young, um, no doubt getting a lot of attention from the opposite sex when they go out and things of that persuasion, it's easy for the ego to get very big and of course that can then affect their performance. Um, but you said something about Managing that ego where it was about them being bigger together as opposed to on their own. Yeah, I read this the book um, 
um, Phil Jackson wrote about, and it was really key. I read it before I started coaching, and, and it was Michael about Michael Jordan. Yep. And it really resonated me when I started coaching, and it was sort of the essence of of team and how do you create a team. Mm-hmm. And everyone individual is different, and but just the wording that Phil had said to Michael, and the way he explained to Michael, and people perhaps don't remember because everyone says Phil Jackson's a great coach and Michael Jordan's a great player, which is absolutely 100%. But but pretty much the same team existed prior to you know, Phil Jackson getting to the Chicago Bulls. And mm-hmm. the way he explained it in the book was really quite dramatic. He explained to Michael, he said, Michael, if you can make our team better, if you can make the other players better, we will win more and you will be seen as a much better player. Yeah. And even and I clearly I've never met Michael Jordan. I don't know whether he's an egomaniac or whether he's level headed. But the way that it was explained to Michael, mm-hmm. and I'll never forget it because what he fundamentally was saying to Michael is even if you're the most selfish, egotistical individual that I've ever coached, mm-hmm. make everyone better and everyone will see you as better. Yep. So it sort of triggered this in <laughs> me that I sort of thought, well, what a, an amazing way to articulate someone that perhaps um, maybe doesn't see it, that yep. sees himself is really, really important. Again, I don't know Michael, so I'm just presuming this was the case. So that that really resonated me from a whole team. How do you – each individual is going to be different. Some are going to give themselves naturally. Some are going to say, well, I'm just a team player mm. and whatever you want me to do, there's others. Because fundamentally in a team sport, and, and having done it myself, you are an individual and your mm. number one priority is to get yourself right. So even the most selfless player has 5% of just me, 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 me. So the one that's got the you know, the 95% me, 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 how do you translate that? So it was a really good way to say, you know, and, it, and it, the good thing was it sort of started to happen. I remember I had this conversation with one of the players and, and along similar lines. I said, mate, look, keep doing your role. And if we keep on winning, you'll make all Australian because suddenly – the media will see us as a much better team. And, and thankfully, luckily, he did make the All-Australian team. Yeah. And what that did is we know that Michael Jordan's now seen as the best player of all time, mm-hmm. won six championships, made his teammates better. Yep. So the ability, I guess, to have those conversations and to explain to people you know, the ramifications of being a great team affect every individual. Everyone is seen as much better. You know, there's a recent conversation mm-hmm. about um, you know, players that haven't won a premiership. Paddy Dangerfield, extraordinary article, really honest article, saying he doesn't feel fulfilled. You know, he's never won a premiership. He looks at other team players really jealous, jealously. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's one of the greatest players of all time. So that concept of team, you know, is huge in, in sport. Some players get it, some players don't get it. But the ability to, to um, you get that across to, to players is, is really yeah, important. Yeah, and uh, essentially what we're doing there is finding what, players or what your employees value and using that to get the desired behavior out of them. And I think that's why relationships, I keep getting back to relate. That's why relationships are so important. Yep. You know, if we've got a standard set of behaviors, then everyone's accountable to those behaviors. But equally around those behaviors, the way I'm going to interact with you is going to be dramatically different the way in a, in, in, with Dylan or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I might, you might be a coffee guy. You might be the guy that I've got a, Steve Cohen, we're going to have a coffee. Yeah. Because you, you know, you're more around the connection and the relationship. Dylan might be the guy that I just walk in and go, mate, don't do that. He goes, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Yep. It's a quick conversation. Yep. But if you don't understand the relationships, you know, I don't want to walk into you and go, mate, don't do that again. That was garbage. And you're, and then I go to Dylan and take him for a coffee mm-hmm. and he's looking at his watch going, mate, come on. I don't need to be spending time with you. Yeah, just tell yeah, me yeah, what yeah. I did wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'll fix it. Yeah. So, so we've, I've wasted time with Dylan mm-hmm. and I haven't taken time with you yep. and the outcome's been really bad for you and bad for him. So mm-hmm. if I don't know what makes each individual tick, it's very hard to become a great leader or manager. Yeah, and it needs, you need to be really tuned into that because nowadays there's a lot of focus on being efficient and just getting – things done with, but sometimes it pays to actually spend more time with someone to develop that relationship in order to truly get the point across rather than just send them an email. It might work with some people, but for a lot of people, it might actually harm the relationship and they might just completely dismiss what you said. And, that, and that's a really good point. So for that one email that you think is is time, is created a lot of time for you because it's only taken a minute to do, mm. a month down the track, you've got to have another meeting and you've got to have a uh, 10 people in the room because that person you've sent the email to got really angry about the email. Mm-hmm. 
So you've actually created more work. Rather than me getting out of my chair, walking in and taking 10 or 15 minutes yep. just to say, mate, have a conversation and then that that sol- problem is solved, the solution is met, mm-hmm. I walk back to my office it's done. So I think, oh, that one minute's a bit easier, but that one minute translates into an hour, two hours of angst later on. The 15 minutes, done. Yep. Done and dusted. We're all over. The, the conversation that's finished. It. Yeah, that's that uh, organizational debt. We call that in the in the corporate world where something just compounds over time yeah. and what you thought was five minutes ends up costing you five hours over yeah. the long term. So um, absolutely love that. Paul, this has been a fantastic conversation. Where can people go to find out more about what you're working on today, whether it's the uh, performance by design stuff or the Roos and Men's Club, or perhaps tell us a little bit more about that and then we'll yeah, definitely. send Look, them some I mean, links. What I'm passionate about now is hopefully you can see through the conversation yes. that is about leadership and personal development and, and helping people. So mm-hmm. the, the, the performance by design, www.performancebydesign.co, that's all about creating you know really good behaviours, purpose, values and behaviours mm-hmm. for your organisation, which we've talked a lot about. Um, the Nurture Group events, as I said, of which I went to last year and I was really fortunate enough to be asked to buy in. So it's www.nurtureherd.com. Mm-hmm. That's the 200 business women leaders and the Nurture 360, which is www.nurture360.com.au. That's a mixed event. Yep. They're both in October. They go back to back. Um, and again, that's about the personal development. That's about business leadership and wellness. So they're wellness business retreats, which is fantastic. And then my son and I have created the Ruse Men's Wellness and Leadership Club and a little bit of background on that. I mean, Tammy's a meditation teacher and, you know, we do a lot of personal development. Mm-hmm. But typically you go to a yoga class and it's sort of 80% women and, yeah. you know, 20% men or 90, 10 sort of thing. So we had this idea as why was that happening? Why are guys not as, um, you know, uh, up with – you know, looking after themselves as, as much mm. as women. So we had this idea of just maybe it's just trying to create a really safe space that the guys just come together as a group of guys and yep. they feel um, less looking around and worrying about what, you know, what everyone else is thinking. Mm. So the first event we did was a leap of faith. It was yoga, meditation. And we had 60 guys turn up, which was amazing, had a, had a great time. So we thought – and the feedback was, was great. Yep. We then had uh, um, Wayne Swash talking about – mental health, his journey, Nick Rewald, Nathan Jones came along and spoke about player welfare at footy clubs. Mm -hmm. That was a 120 sit-down dinner. We then had Shelley Laslett, who's a neuroscience. She came and spoke about how the male brain works and leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the last one we had was a joint thing with Performance by Design and Maru's Men's Wellness and Leadership Club. Um, Our next one's a network event on September the 19th. Um, We're building a website at the moment, so you can go on to www.dylanroosecoaching.com and just link into the um, the, the tab, Roos Men's Club. Um, so, yeah, look, where that heads, but we're really excited about it. Mm. It's been really well ex- received. You've got a retreat of your own planned for, what is it, Fiji in October? Yeah, so Fiji is the Nurture, yeah, Nurture Her, yep. Nurture 360. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we're really looking forward to that, looking forward to getting great business. So, again, everything sort of dovetails and everyone mm. is you know, sort of really passionate about that leadership space and, and, and helping people Fantastic. and personal development. Well, we'll add those links to the show notes for our listeners. And lucky last, Paul, how do you stay on top of your game these days? I imagine you meditate based on what I'm hearing, but what else do you do on a daily basis? Yeah, I think meditation is really good. You know, get up and meditate most mornings. Um, mm-hmm. I've been probably one of my challenges to get organized. You know, when you're in a footy environment, mm-hmm. you know, you, everything is so structured. You know, so what I'm learning a bit more about myself is, is how to, you know, put everything um because i'm sort of we touched on before i I like to get things done but you know in a more slower paced environment it's not getting overly frustrated and Mm. and just understanding how different the corporate world may look to the sporting world Mm -hmm. um so trying to i think the hardest thing is trying to put a day aside just to get everything together just to get everything so making sure there's at least a day a week where i can just sit back and say right Mm -hmm. who do i need to phone back now Mm -hmm. who do i need to follow up on because you know, I mean, the emails and and you know, LinkedIn and all the different ways people can communicate now. Yep. If you let it get away from you, you can get on top of you. Yeah, you know, exercise. I like to you know go for a run probably two or three times a week. Mm-hmm. It's a little gym in the garage sort of thing. So yeah, just getting into a routine, which is a lot easier when you're coaching a footy club than perhaps when what I'm doing now. 
but trying to get back to that routine. I think the other message for me is keep it simple, you know, yeah. whatever that routine is. You, know, you don't have to go – if you love to, that's great, but you don't have to go for a two-hour bike ride. You don't have to go to the gym for an hour, an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to meditate for half an hour. Just make it five, ten minutes. Yeah. Keep it really simple, even from an eating habit point of view. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the diets that we have now are so hard to follow and people get yeah. so frustrated with um, with what they are. Um, and I've been involved with Manshake for many, many years mm-hmm. and what Adam McDougall's done is really simple. You know, just just grab a Manshake instead of a – a sausage roll, you yeah. know, instead of an egg and bacon roll. Yeah. You know, just I think the simpler the better because the simpler it is, the more likely you are to follow it. Mm-hmm. You know, if it becomes really, really complicated, it's just it's a lot easier yeah. to go, I'm not, I can't do it today, I can't do it today. So keep your diet simple, keep your processes simple, your exercise simple, and the simpler it is, the more likely you are to follow it. That's it. Well, perfect way to end this podcast. Paul, thank you so much. It's been a fantastic conversation. Yeah, thanks, mate. Terrific. Hi guys, Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gleveski and on Instagram at TheSteveGleveski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.